Good morning to you. Mark Sutter with HurricaneTrack.com here with your Hurricane Outlook and discussion for Sunday, the 9th of July, 2017. Let's take a look at what's going on this morning. Look at this mess out here in the Atlantic, Southwest Atlantic. This is the leftovers of Tropical Depression 4. Had a little bit of a flare up last night as it's interacting with this upper level low. Looked a little bit impressive, maybe a little menacing to some, thinking maybe it's trying to come back. Uh, don't worry, it's uh, really not showing up in the global models too much at all, and the low level center um, kind of displaced from this deep convection here, uh, and this really isn't going to do much. So pay no mind, pay no attention to that system, no worries from that. Looking in the eastern Pacific briefly, Hurricane Eugene forming well off the coast of Mexico, forecast to become a major hurricane with winds above 111 miles an hour, something like that, and uh, that should send some decent swells this way over time. So if you want to go down to Cabo and do some surfing, I guess you can do so and enjoy the nice swells that are going to be headed your way. And, you know, that is a hazard, so people that are venturing out that way do keep that in mind. And this will bring some moisture uh, up into the southwest United States, not like we see in later August and September when these troughs come in and sort of scoop these things up towards the Baja directly and then they die off and send their moisture up. This will contribute just a little bit overall to the southwest semi-monsoon pattern and increase the moisture content out that way. Looking at a satellite animation of Eugene, fairly well-developed Category 2 hurricane and not going to affect any land area directly, which is good news. So it'll eventually peter out over colder water, which resides up here along the path farther to the north and west up here. It'll start to sort of just dwindle away like Dora did before uh, as it encountered those colder waters. And this will churn up the water and keep it cooler than average in the eastern Pacific. And eventually, I believe, the Atlantic will catch up and probably surpass what's happening in the East Pacific. So now we turn our attention to this tropical wave and what the overnight models have shown. There it is right there off the coast of Africa and it's really getting a lot of attention, rightfully so. We can track these things. I mean look, there's even more energy over interior Africa as it is and if we watch the models and you look long enough Hey, out of the time, you can see what happens with some of these, and it shows you sort of the symptom, if you will, the background state that the Atlantic Basin is way more favorable this year. I mean, here it is, July 9th, and we're talking about yet the potential for yet another system to develop in the main development region. We're not talking about systems forming off of frontal lows coming off the United States mainland, like during an El Nino year, you get a front that comes off and then you get a low pressure that develops and off it goes to the northeast. We call those frontal lows or frontal development and that's typical of a year when you're not going to see much activity in the deep tropics. You know, it's more subtropical uh, development. This is your tried and true deep tropical development and you bet this area right here uh, has my attention and maybe later today we will see if the National Hurricane Center mentions this in one of their outlooks. Haven't done so yet. Yeah, you know they're watching it, but not quite enough evidence in the global models for what we call tropical cyclone genesis. Uh, yet, you know, there's not enough of a consensus. Usually those that look at this stuff and make decisions like that, uh, I would assume... You know, you want to see the GFS develop it, the European model develop it, and the United Kingdom MET model, the UK MET. Those three, when all three of them show it, then you definitely are going to see an outlook. And it's just, you know, you don't want to jump on something and it turns out that it's just phantom. And remember, the models, especially the GFS, have somewhat been waffling back and forth. And there was a period of time yesterday where the GFS all but dropped that uh, this system, which of course has changed. We'll get to that. 
So let's see what we've got. Let's look at the evidence in front of us. That's part of what I like to do when I analyze these things myself. So we look at the Saharan air situation and the tropical wave and its energy far enough to the south that even this very strong outbreak of Saharan air coming off now would be far enough to the north. And you see that there's a pretty decent dent in the moisture intruding into that Saharan air uh, out in front of the system. So that bodes fairly well for this to develop. And it looks like it's going to stay at a fairly low latitude as well, hugging roughly the 10 degree north latitude line, which of course extends all the way over towards the southern Windward Islands here, just for what it's worth. And so this will, all of this will just move in tandem. I don't think this will be moving faster and then catch up to all this. Everything's just going to kind of move together like a, a conveyor belt. And that's important to note as well. And then we look at the vorticity signature and you say, hey, look at that. Right where the uh, energy is in the cloud shot, we can see on this product from the University of Wisconsin site, increasing vorticity or spin in the atmosphere starting to take shape. And look, it's round already. It's not amorphic, you know, like this or, you know, whatever that is up there in the North Atlantic. I mean, you've seen these videos for me enough now to know what I'm looking for. And right there, put a check mark that with it being round like that, uh, that's definitely a sign that there's something there. So we shall see. And then we look at the upper ocean heat content. Again, this is one of the clues that I look for. And uh, the system's well off the... Well, actually, I guess it's about right here now. And so it's going to be moving towards increasing ocean heat content, especially in and around the vicinity of about 40 degrees west longitude. And so this becomes my sort of line in the sand. doesn't have too far to go. And then that upper ocean heat content will increase. And that means that the water temperatures are warm, not only at the surface, but that warm water extends fairly deep down in the ocean, and it begins to increase that upper ocean heat content uh, just before 40 degrees longitude. And then it just gets warmer from there and points west, as you can see. All right, so with all that being said, I want to go look at the Zero Z GFS. Now, the GFS is run four times a day, and uh, that would be Zero Z, Six Z, Twelve Z, and Eighteen Z. What does all that mean, real quick? You know, we have we have people that watch the video that have never seen it before. Um, Zulu Time or UTC Universal Time Coordinate. Basically, the GFS Global Forecast System is initialized and run at four different times. I've already said that, but those times correspond to roughly, well, not roughly, they're uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Time is 0 UTC, Universal Time Coordinate, or Zulu Time. And then 2 a.m. Eastern Time would be the 6Z run. And then 8 a.m. Eastern Time would be the 12Z run. 2 p.m. Eastern Time would be the 18Z run. Make sense? Uh, so those are run four times a day. The 0Z and the 12Z are the two major synoptic runs where they have the weather balloon upper air data from all over the world incorporated into them. Um, and then I believe the 6Z and the 18Z runs are interpolated off of that data. Uh, and there's some satellite data that gets ingested into the off major runs too. But in my opinion, over the years... The 0 and the 12 Zs are the two major runs. And the off ones, the 6 and the 18s, they're not, I don't know, I just, I like the 12 and the 0. Let's just say that, all right? I know I'm explaining it too much, but this is what I look at. So at the 0 Z run last night, the important thing is, do we have on the initial map, and that's right here, our triple zero right there, do we have a good initialization? Did it get the data correct? Now, I can't speak about the rest of the world and all the different soundings that are done from weather balloons and other instruments, but off the coast of Africa right there, yes, it picked up on the vorticity last night. All right? There it was just coming off the coast of Africa. And, of course, right now we know that this has moved 
this way just a little bit and is sitting just south of the Cape Verde Islands. But this was last night initialized at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. So there is the initial vorticity signature spin in the atmosphere at about 5,000 feet up. We can also see this very well-defined deep layer. I mean, it looks like a topographic map, right? Uh, and this would be our huge dome of high pressure over the Atlantic, what we call the subtropical ridge, firmly in place. So if we put this into motion, we're going to look out at the next five days, and you'll see what happens. All right, so let's do that. Watch the system right down here. If I can draw on it. There it is, moving on out. It kind of disappears a little bit, but then it starts to come back at about 48 hours, right there near 40 degrees longitude, like I was talking about, probably sensing the warmer waters through there. Uh, the GFS has a lot of input data, and it knows about the sea surface temperatures. It knows about land masses and mountains and all kinds of things. So you see, let's just start over here. It comes off here, and then it finally starts to show up. Uh, we're at about 36 hours, so at roughly 40 hours, it starts to come back, if you will, and then it takes off from there as a fairly well-developed little tropical storm in the model. This is not a large system, uh, and then you can see it's kind of dipping south just a little bit there, and then it increases latitude again at the end of the run. So let me just stop that and go to the last frame. There it is at 120 hours out, and then what I've done is I've zoomed in on it, and we can see, and this is important, this is five days from now. This is not eight days, this is not 10 days, 12 days, model fantasy land, all that stuff. This is 120 hours out in time. And what does it show? It shows a well-developed tropical storm in the model field. Tropical cyclone, I mean, I'll be general about it. Uh, I wouldn't know for sure that it's a tropical storm, but it sure looks like one. Looking at the vorticity signature and the, the way it's shaped and you know the wind barbs in here, five days, and it's right on the doorstep. There's Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago down here. You know, St. Lucia and the Grenadines are up here. I mean, come on, five days away. So we're going to have to really, really watch this. And the 6Z run shows the same thing. Uh, it didn't back off, you know, where we got this, oh, that was just one run, and it's back to crickets after that. So if we put this out into motion just for, you know, the sake of argument, this is 120 hours. Let's just move along. This is every three hours. So if we go out here, then, you know, we're looking at about 135, 138 hours. It's very close to Barbados and St. Lucia, uh, north of Trinidad and Tobago. But, I mean, wow, that's not that long. So something's going to have to happen here, and I'm going to go back to the wider shot, and we're going to go to the very first frame and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in down here. Man, I love this program that I use for what it's worth. And uh, I'm going to click on this. I want to show you what am I looking for. Like, what, what's, the, what's the break point here? When will we know? So there's the initial condition right there. There's the vorticity signature. And we can look at this, and you can see you, know, you got this sort of a little westerly wind component here, sort of this broad turning, almost like a monsoon trough city in here with the tropical wave and its energy. So that's all there. you got that sort of cocoon or pouch of energy there, as some people call it. And so let's see what happens over time. And I'm going to just use the arrow keys. In fact, let me grab some water here so I don't get the old dry throat syndrome. Got a lot to talk about. This is important. So let's go through and uh, well, let's see if we can get the computer to not do that. All right, so uh, this is three hours. Let's just go on out. See, it kind of moves along, and you know the vorticity signature kind of goes away a little bit, but you can still see the reflection just a hair in the uh, the wind barbs here, you know, right through here, still there. But when is the sort of time that it starts to flare up again? Uh, we're at 30 hours, so you can just kind of see it moving along in there. So by about 48 hours, right there, 48 hours out is when we start to see it 
come back, if you will, and start to show up a little better. You know, some of that's about 25 knots of wind in there. You know, that's it. So 48 hours out. Less than that now, since this was last night's run, that's the key. You know, and then we go a little farther out into time from there. Let's just go to 60 hours for the sake of argument. At 60 hours, it should start to look like it's going to do something, and it's crossing 40 degrees longitude at that point in time. And I want you to notice as well the background trade winds through here. Um, generally not that strong. So this is not going to just be racing out at 25 knots, sheared apart, whatever. You know, uh, where it's embedded down here, these trades are not that strong. So it'll probably be moving, I don't know, 10 to 15 miles per hour. And that's important. So there you go. That's the, uh, you know, that analysis. This is what it looks like. Let's back this off at, uh, 138 hours. And I want to go back to, 120 because I want to show you something there it is at 120 according to the GFS last night what does the euro show at 120 nothing well I won't say nothing but certainly not what the year uh, GFS shows there it is at 120 sort of strung out vorticity <sighs> one day hopefully everything will align and we won't have this kind of discrepancy um, because you want to be able to believe in this stuff. It's like, come on. You know, we've got viewers down in the islands. We have people with huge vested interest in tropical cyclone activity for obvious reasons. And when we've got one model, you know, the GFS here showing that, and then another model not showing that. But wait, a few days ago it did show that. What do you do? I mean, honestly, that's tough. So that's what I'm here for, uh, at least what I like to do anyway. And we're going to talk about it a couple times a day here going forward. And um, so with that being said, I'll come back this afternoon after the 12Z runs come out. They've all been initialized. They're being processed by the supercomputers of the world. And that data will start to come out in the early part of the afternoon. And we'll take a look at that later today um, around 2 o'clock or so. All right, so that's what I know from the overnight stuff. The plot sort of thickens once again because the GFS looked like it was backing off, and then, oh, hey, there it is again, and the euro is still you know, kind of holding its cards close to its chest, so to speak. All right, so there you go. Um, that's it. We're going to wait and see what happens a few hours down the road. I always appreciate you tuning in and listening and watching and you learn along with me because never, ever are all of these things going to ever be the same. No two of them are ever going to be alike. It's always a challenge. I'm Mark Stout of HurricaneTrack.com. Again, thanks a lot for tuning in this morning. I'll be back in several hours later today, early this afternoon. Um, we'll say around 2 o'clock with another look at what's happening with this system.